Well, hey, folks, welcome to the Dr. Berg Show. It appears that we have lost Dr. Berg for just a second, so we're going to put up this fancy sign until we reconnect with him. Dr. Berg, are you with us? Folks, stand by. Big show coming up. We're just going to reconnect with the host. All right, Steve, are you there? Yeah, stand by. We're going to bring up your visage again. Just a moment. There we go. Take it away, Dr. Berg. All right, great. Listen, um, thanks for being here, everyone. Uh, anything that I say is not meant to diagnose you or, you know, act as a substitute for your medical care. So check with your doctor before taking any of the advice I'm about to give you. So uh, with that being said, Steve, um, I suggest we just jump right in. We have a lot of questions. I want to try to get as many answered as possible today. All right. I think it's great. And by the way, I do remember the first person that came in with us today into the green room, and that's Mike from Prague. He corrected me. I said Prague or something stupid, but he, he fixed me up. But he is, in fact, from the Czech Republic, and he's got a question for you, Dr. Berg. Unmute yourself, uh, Mike, and you're on with Dr. Berg. Okay. Hello, Dr. Berg. Uh, Hi, I want to ask a question. Um, I'm six foot three. I'm 194 pounds. And I have a 22% body fat, which uh, means that my body type is can be described as skinny fat. And uh, I was uh, I was trying ketogenic diet for over a month uh, now, and um, the results aren't too significant. So I want to ask you if, uh, in my case, uh, shouldn't I be more focusing on muscle growth and, um, let's say working out and therefore, uh, maybe consuming more carbohydrates because mm -hmm. as you said, in one of your videos, uh, carbs stimulate insulin, which is a uh, anabolic hormone, which makes things grow, which eventually can help me lower the body fat percentage. Um, what do you think? My yeah, good, good, good question. Yeah. It is true that insulin is an anabolic hormone. It makes things get bigger. The problem is it um, also makes your fat increase in your body. It does not it decrease your fat percentage. It increases it. So the point is like if you're trying to get leaner, which I think that's your goal, that also makes your fat. What's that? Hey, Dr. No, Burke, we have a new I, folk I on, uh, and uh, our gentleman from India, if you just mute yourself, please, and we'll get to you shortly. Go ahead, Mike. Oh. Yeah, uh, okay, I was just listening to Dr. Burke. Okay, so a um, couple things. Uh, the insulin uh, will will tend to increase your, your, your muscles, but it also at the same time increases the fat. This is why you have people that do a lot of carbs. They get bigger both in muscle and fat. <laughs> So um, it doesn't make you leaner. So I think the other thing you need to know is that there's another way to increase insulin without doing the carbs, and that is through a little more protein. So protein will increase your insulin, and um, also another hormone called glucagon, which can also help you become thinner and less body fat. That's a better way to go. So if you actually add heavier weights... Um, less reps, you'll get the muscle mass, and then lower carb. Keep your carb low, you know, and then you'll get lean, and then you can um, you can also get the benefit of um, a low carb diet, as well as the uh, improvement in your muscle mass. The key with muscle mass is is stimulation of your muscles through exercise, through uh, weight training, resistance training, um, and not go crazy on the intermittent fasting. So maybe just do two meals a day. Uh, keep your carbs maybe a little bit higher, like maybe at 50 grams. So you can actually then get some carb. But as soon as you get over that mark, you, you bumps yourself out of ketosis and you kind of um, invalidate the benefits of 
of fasting as well as a low carb diet, which there's so many other benefits other than just weight loss, uh, cognitive benefits. So that's what I would I would look at. I I think you're, you know, I'm I'm six two. I weigh 180, um, 83. So you're six three, I think, and you're 190. So um, I think you're you're pretty close to where you should be, but I think I would just tweak those few things. And, uh, um, you can also add more exercise. You can also get more sleep. You can reduce stress to get leaner. And, um, and that's what I would do if I were you. Oh, can't hear you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, you mentioned glucagon, uh, as an enzyme, how, uh, how can I get that in, into my, uh, organism? Glucagon is a hormone, and you don't you don't get it. It naturally occurs um, when you consume protein, when you exercise. Um, it's it's a hormone that also, and when you fast, so it's a hormone that works in reverse of insulin. So um, glucagon and insulin work like a teeter totter effect. So if you want to increase glucagon, you just need to lower insulin go low carb, but protein, moderate protein will increase glucagon and so will intense exercise. So you get the benefit of glucagon as well as growth hormone too, which is going to preserve your muscles to prevent the loss of muscle and stimulate the growth of your muscles. So you, you can, you can improve yourself in several ways that way. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, that's terrific. Well, listen, thanks so much for kicking it off with us, Mike. We appreciate that. And now let's just talk about Mike came from uh, Prague, and we've got people joining from the from the UK, uh, Canada, Spain, Jordan, Malaysia, the Philippines, the Czech Republic, India, Thailand, Australia, Uganda, Mexico, Germany, Romania, Jordan, Zambia, been there, Slovenia, Ghana, Sweden, Dubai, the Netherlands, Morocco, Sudan, Saudi Arabia, Belgium, Taiwan, Algeria, Chile. This is all in one breath, by the way. And all across these United States, uh, one viewer claims to be from Pluto. Well, good for you. I didn't know that they had uh, the Dr. Berg show, show there, but he certainly reached out uh, around the uh, solar system now. So that's terrific. And why don't we kick things off with a question from Facebook. Joseph from Facebook uh, if I use MCT oil and stevia, will my cough uh, with my coffee? Am I breaking my fast? In theory, yes, you're breaking your fast because anything other than you know water is going to break a fast, unless you're doing a dry fast. Um, but it's going to be insignificant because you're going you're not going to do carbs, and if it's pure fat, you won't increase insulin. So. For the most part, um, a lot of the benefits, not all of them, but a good portion of the benefits from fasting come from keeping your insulin low. So if you were to um, have periodic, you know, some MCT oil, I think that's going to help you. Um, but there are other benefits on not doing that and just doing water. Um, and I talk about that, but it, that would be mainly for cancer. So you wouldn't want to necessarily do the uh, fat um, MCT oil if you have cancer when you're fasting. But for everyone else, I think it would be a good thing because it's going to help you fast longer. It's going to help you generate more ketones for your brain. And um, it won't increase insulin. And you also don't have to worry about your taking your vitamins. That's, taking vitamins are so low in calories, it's not going to be anything you have to worry about to be significant and to interrupt your fasting. So I would not worry about that at all. Wonderful. Okay. And then Sharon from Facebook, what is the best form of vitamin C to take? Well, you want a food source. Uh, I always like the uh, concentrated berries. Uh, that's good. Um, there's other sources of like uh, the, um, was it, um, it's called an olive berry or something. There's certain, there's a lot of different berries out there that are loaded with vitamin C. You have also the bioflavonoids, which is part of the vitamin C complex, and the citrus. They have citrus-type um, supplements. Um, but also from food, you know, bell peppers, any of the peppers, uh, sauerkraut. Uh, most vegetables are loaded with vitamin C. 
um, some even some organ meats, but typically regular just meat in general is not high in vitamin C. So that's why you want your salads. So, uh, but the berries are, are a good source of vitamin C, especially if it's in a supplement. That's wonderful. Listen, why don't we kick it off with the first question? Here you go, Dr. Berg. Okay. So here's the first question. What country in the world uh, leads in plastic consumption? I see that we, you altered. I was ready for another <clears throat> version of this question, but yeah, what's the top country in the world that consumes the most plastic? All right. So let's, uh, let's dig away at that. And I tell you the plastic, you know, I don't normally get so much into the whole environmental stuff, but plastic is an absolute mess, floating miles of that mass. And when I heard that it just breaks down into little microscopic pellets and never goes away, or at least not for, you know, many, many eons, it's really a mess. We've got to get our stuff together on that. But let's see who's the biggest culprit with that question. And uh, with that being said, why don't we go to another one of our great uh, callers. And Eric, I'm going to put you on the spot here. He's leaning over right now, but we're going to get him back. Eric? I want you to get on the air, unmute yourself, and say hello to Dr. Berg all the way from, uh, where are you from, Eric? You're from St. Thomas. I'm jealous. St. Thomas. Yeah, speak uh, up a little bit for us, Eric. I can hear you. I need you, you need to turn up your speaker a little bit. Oh, okay. All right. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's fine. Go ahead, Eric. Uh, hi, Dr. Berg. Hi. Hi. Um, before I get to my question, I want to say that I'm a big fan of yours. I've taken your keto and intermittent fasting courses, and you've been such an inspiration for me. And I want, and I want to just can't thank you enough. And, and I've been doing keto with oh. intermittent fasting, and I and by the in September it'd be one year, and so I'm excited uh, and wow. I'm happy for it. So my question is regarding um, vitamin D absorption. So the thing is that I live in St. Thomas where it's sunny all the time and I would get um, sunburned, you know, quite quickly. So the thing is that the problem is, is that I want to absorb vitamin D, but at the same time, I don't want to get sunburned. So my question to you is, is there like a natural sunscreen that you recommend? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, actually vitamin F, um, uh, protects you against the vitamin excessive vitamin D. Um, that would be like the essential uh, oils um, internally. So if you were to take um, uh, some flax oil or omega-3 fatty acids, um, cod liver oil, for example, that will help you um, from some of the excessive, you know, rays from that you're getting radiation from the sun. Um, I know the problem that you're up against. I think... Um, if you were to get a little bit of sun over a period of time, not crazy, you should your your skin should adapt to it, and you should start noticing that you're getting a little tan, and then you can start absorbing more of the sun rays that way. Because um, ideally, the best way um, to get your vitamin D is from the sun. But the problem is, like if you're fair fair complected, you're not gonna uh, get you're gonna burn. And so for those people, you know. <laughs> realize this um the whiter your skin the faster you're going to get the vitamin d so uh because you don't have that melanin to block uh and the darker the skin the more exposure that you need so you may not need as much as someone else but um if you're burning i would just take it take it from the um from a supplement and also you can take the protective factors the other oils um so you can take the omega-3 fatty acids and maybe some flax oil. Um, and also a good protective vitamin from vitamin D is K2. I'm going to do a video on that. And I'm telling you, one of the best sources of vitamin K2 is in butter or grass-fed butter. Um, you can do the Kerrygold or some other really good European butter that they have out there, grass-fed, uh, because the grass feeds the cow and then there's a conversion that takes place um, in the cow to from k1 to k2 because grass is really high in vitamin k1 and then converts to k2 and vitamin k2 is has everything to do with uh, transporting calcium in a child it's essential because it'll it'll de help develop a child's facial structure so um 
like children that are deficient in K2 have, um, they, they'll need braces. Their kind of face is thinner. They don't have that, uh, that good structure. They have a lot of teeth problems, cavities. So K2 is very, very important, especially in a child and then even an infant. Um, you, they're going to get K2 from breast milk, um, but they can also get it from butter. So you want to feed your kids a good amount of butter, make sure it's grass-fed. Uh, I remember as a child, um, I craved butter. And now I know why, because I was very deficient in K2. And of course, I had a lot of dental work, unfortunately, but uh, butter is the solution. I used to consume a whole pound of butter in one sitting. Um, I should have kept that up. Wow. Well, unfortunately, we lost Eric. And so, Eric, you probably desperately then logged onto your computer. And if you just caught the last part of Dr. Berg's answer to you, uh, we'd encourage everyone to uh, look at and realize that these shows all broadcast both on YouTube and Facebook uh, pretty soon after the end of the show. So, Eric, if you just caught the last part of that, we urge you to listen to the show. You did a terrific job. And we know you're having a blast in St. Thomas. And don't get sunburned. And Dr. Berg, we've got answers for our first question, which uh, I guess we changed on you. But basically, which country leads the world in plastic consumption? And our audience suggested that 90% was due to the USA's consumption and 10% say China. Uh, who is right, Dr. Berg? Well, the 90% is right. It's the U.S. If you live in the U.S., you're consuming at least, on average, a credit card a day. A plastic. I mean, I know I don't do that. So there's probably a lot of people that are consuming a lot more than one credit card of plastic every single day. But um, um, yeah, that's the situation, Steve. So uh, be careful of what you eat. Yeah, you want to go on a low plastic diet. <laughs> no kidding. And I've heard that plastic has those uh, chemicals that inhibit hormone and testosterone goes down. So like bottled water is not really that great a thing, regardless of the content the water itself, but rather the problems with the plastic, isn't it, Dr. Berg? Yeah, so a lot of that plastic leaches out, and uh, especially if you microwave in plastic containers, that's probably the worst. But it's, um, but it's also in your drinking water. So if you don't have a good filter, if you do tap water, you're going to have a problem because it goes right through because the plastic is in the water supply, unfortunately, unless you are fortunate to live in an area where you can just get it right from the, the water from the spring from your, you know, under the earth. But um, not everyone has that luxury. Great. Well, listen, people were awfully quick with that. And I want to make sure we get to every question. So here's the next one, Doc. All right. So what is the best vitamin to help support or lessen vertigo? Okay. That's a form of dizziness where you, you might um, move your head and you feel really dizzy or you're out of balance or you feel spinny. Um, what vitamin should you be taking if you have vertigo? All right. Well, that's an interesting question. Can't wait for the answer from our smart audience. And Karen from Facebook, speaking of audience, I'm three months into OMAD and my fasting blood sugar is now at 150, even with apple cider vinegar. Help! Well, um... I'm assuming she's not a diabetic, okay? But what happens, especially in the morning with a lot of people when they start keto, not a lot, it's a small percentage, but their blood sugars start going higher. Now, how can that be, Steve, if you're not consuming any sugar? How could that be if you're on a low-carb diet? It doesn't, it doesn't sound logical. Beats me. But what, you have, what you have to realize is that sugar is not coming from the diet. It's coming from your liver. Your liver is making sugar. It's called gluco neo genesis the formation of new sugar and it's in the liver and your body is making the sugar from fat ketones and protein interesting so the best thing to do is um exercise more to burn it off and just realize over time that blood sugar will come down you can also do apple cider vinegar before bed that will help you um but the body is sensing it's not um you know, insulin's still not working. So it's sensing there's a, a problem with the sugar metabolism. So it's just making more. That, that's all. It's, it's, it's just you have you had a history of a very severe insulin resistance. And now it's just your body is, have, is making more because it thinks that the brain is not getting enough when it is. So um, that's what you, 
that's what's really going on. It's nothing to worry about. It will come down over time if you keep doing it. All right, that's terrific. By the way, we've got lovely Lillian from London Ooh. on with us. Hi, Dr. Berg. This is almost, um, uh, I feel like you're a celebrity. This is exciting. <laughs> Um, yes, I have a question because I started both your courses. I've been following a lot of your videos and I started initially with intermittent fasting and then uh, saw your videos and started on keto. I used to be very athletic and I'm not really overweight, but I definitely have um, visceral fat, doesn't want to move, subcutaneous fat. Um, and, uh, the one thing that I found was, uh, I had a lot of problems with vegetables. I had intolerances, so I had to sort out all my intolerance. It was literally to almost every veg. Um, and, uh, I've sorted that now, as far as I know. Um, so I'm assuming this comes from intermittent fasting uh, in that I, a, I don't really seem to get into ketosis. Um, and I'm constantly fatigued. I struggle going upstairs. Um, I get like burning muscles, like they, they're on fire. Um, and so my question is, is it possible that that uh, inflammation comes from intermittent fasting? Um, I have done up to nearly three days, but then I got quite faint. Um, but generally on a day to day, it's between 16 to 18 hours. And I've been doing this for nearly a year or actually over a year. Yeah. Damaged damage. So there's probably some malabsorption issues. And with that comes an altered uh, microbiome. So the microbes are not quite right yet in your GI system, which can very easily produce more lactic acid than you might need. And that can could be why you're tired. It could be why you your muscles are still sore. That's just one, one idea. Um, I don't know if you've tried doing carnivore for a while, the healthy version of it. So you're not just doing meat, you're doing organ meats and maybe some eggs or some seafood, things like that. I don't know if that would help you, but I think what would help you is to start taking a really high, good, high quality, good source of probiotics. Um, that I think that's what you really need and to support the gut more because that's, that seems to be your weak link from what you told me. Um, I think in theory, <laughs> the lo longer you fast, the better you should be in theory. But, um, you may need to take probiotics while you're fasting. Um, but if you have the visceral fat um, and you start fasting and you get tired, then you, there's some supplement that you're, you're needing. You know, so make sure you're taking all the, right, you know, all the key ones, especially tocotrienols with that vitamin E, especially if there's muscle issue, especially if, if there's fatigue because uh, vitamin E can really make you stronger very fast. Um, so the other problem, if you have gut issues, you could be running into just malabsorption. You're not able to absorb these nutrients. And so you're kind of tired, especially when you're fasting, in which case you just need to take more of those supplements. And um, those are all things I would do. And if you're taking the right supplements and you're fasting, your body's adapting, especially if you've done it for a year, in theory, you should feel better and you should eventually lose that visceral fat if you fast long enough, which could take even longer than three days. So those are some things I would, I would just uh, try to implement and see if that can help you. Okay. Awesome. Thanks for the question. Yeah, that's terrific. Thanks so much, Lillian. We appreciate that. Hope you enjoy the rest of the show. And let's go to back to our quiz question, which is, which is a, which vitamin is best for preventing or, you know, dealing with vertigo and our audience 72% say B vitamins, 18% say vitamin D, 5% uh, 
say, vitamin A and 5%, say, vitamin E. And I'll tell you, Terry has really been doing the math here with these uneven percentages. So he's got some kind of calculator going. But uh, we got any winners in that group? Yeah, we do. It's actually uh, vitamin D. Uh, I'm telling you, how many problems come come from a vitamin D deficiency? It's huge. Um, but, but this is, um, I'm going to do a video on this. There's some real interesting data on what's behind this vertigo thing. And one of the key medications that a lot of people use works by inhibiting calcium. It's in a calcium antagonist. So that tells us there could be calcium building up in the little hairs in the inner ear in which vitamin D can help uh, regulate that because vitamin D helps with calcium metabolism. But also there's a lot of other reports on the benefits of taking vitamin K2. So I would... If I were you, if you have vertigo, I would take both D and K2. And um, you might need a little more K2 because vitamin K2 will mobilize the excess amount of calcium from the places that it shouldn't be and put them in the places it should be, like the bone. So it's vitamin D and K2 are the two things that I would take if, if I had vertigo. Wonderful. Well, that's a... a, a um... A terrible issue for some for many people. Uh, speaking of issues, uh, Elaine from YouTube, we'll go over to YouTube now, asks about the best thing to do about uh, blackhead, sort of an earthy subject. But what do you say, Doc? That's a, um, a problem with um, a vitamin deficiency. Usually it's vitamin A. Uh, this is why like Accutane does help. But the problem, it comes with a package is some serious side effects because it's a synthetic version of vitamin A. I would do a natural version, cod liver oil. I would also try to help regulate androgens um, because that's another issue with um, the, not this is the sebaceous gland that's like the uh, oil gland with the um, with the problem with uh, imbalances with other vitamins that then form this little black head or a white head. So uh, if you were to take um, a good amount of um, food that has, uh, vitamin A and vitamin D, and that's cod liver oil. And you were to lower your carbs. That way, that will help regulate your androgens. Um, that's going to help. And then fasting. Those three things are going to be very powerful uh, for blackheads and also acne. But this is why teenagers have such a problem with acne, because the high levels of androgens that are occurring, probably also because of the amount of carbs they're consuming as well. So I wish I would have known that going through high school because I had terrible acne and uh, here I am trying to scrub it away when in fact it was all the carbohydrates that I was consuming, Steve. Massive amount of carbohydrates. I had no idea of this connection and uh, as I was downing the sugar, I was scrubbing my face thinking that was going to work. It never worked, Steve. Yeah, well, I used to treat mine with Hostess Twinkies, and I didn't find any great results with that either. Uh, but I tell you what, here's poor Cray from YouTube who has liver disease, and there's a lot of that going around, but wants to know your thoughts on fasting and what effect uh, that might have with his liver disease. Didn't indicate whether it's just you know, fatty liver or alcohol-based. I don't know if that makes a difference. I, I did a video on this. I think fasting is one of the, a great thing for the liver. Um, the liver is such a hub of so many biochemical reactions that occur, and um, it doesn't hold toxins. It breaks toxins down, and so it's not filled with toxins. Um, and so you, when, you, when you have liver problems, you have an inability to break down toxins. So um, fasting will start to create a, uh, this condition called autophagy, which is the recycling of damaged proteins. And if you have scar tissue, if you have fibrosis or cirrhosis in the liver, uh, fasting is the best thing that, to uh, implement. And it's great for the liver. Your liver will be very happy when you fast versus eating six times a day where you're constantly stressing out and forcing the liver to work and work and work and overwork. Um, but one of the worst things to do for the liver, um, which I think... Let's see if uh, this is one of the quiz questions before I say anything. Uh, yeah, I can say this. Um, Tylenol. Tylenol is um, acetaminophen. Is, is, is probably, it's in the U.S., it's the number one cause of liver transplant. It's second in the world. 
So that's a, another cause, thing that you need to avoid. And then, of course, um, anything that creates inflammation, carbs, omega-6 fatty acids, bad for the liver, like soy oil, terrible for the liver. Wow, terrible stuff. We've got to take care of the liver because you can't live without it. And uh, so San, if I'm saying that right, from YouTube wants to know, hi, and this is a great question. How much vitamin D do we need daily if you're not getting a blood test? And he, and, and he also adds, so happy I know you, Dr. Berg, which is a sentiment that we hear reflected many times. So what about the vitamin D? I'm taking 20,000 IUs of your formula, D3 and K2. Uh, I would have thought that was overkill. But I feel great. I do that every day, and I haven't uh, developed any blotches or anything, Dr. Berg. I feel terrific. I've done so many videos on the toxicity of vitamin D. You'd have to consume hundreds of thousands of um, international units over months to create a toxic effect. In the, it seems to me the biggest toxic effect would be too much calcium in the blood, which then can create a kidney stone. Uh, but there's not a lot of other bad effects other than pretty much that, um, that I've seen. Um, so if you were to drink two and a half liters of water a day, that would drast drastically reduce it. So now let's come, let's reverse that and, and talk just about 10,000 I use of vitamin D3, which is not that large an amount. So I think that would be a good maintenance dose. Um, 20,000 20, I use is really good if you're trying to use it therapeutically to do something. Um, but here's the thing, why am I recommending 10,000 IUs when, you know, they say you only need like 600 IUs? Well, simply because um, most people in the world are deficient in vitamin D, the great majority. And um, also, there's a lot of other barriers that people have with absorbing vitamin D, malabsorption in the gut. Um, the darker your skin is, the more vitamin D you're going to need. Um, the fatter you are, the more vitamin D you're going to need. The older you are, the more vitamin D you're going to need. I just met someone recently who has um, this genetic defect. It's, a, it's called a polymorphism with vitamin D, which, by the way, is not terribly rare. It's not terribly common, but it's you know quite a few people have it. Where, And you can get um, a test for this. Uh, and she found out she she's not absorbing any vitamin D. And so when she started taking vitamin D, oh my goodness, all sorts of great things happened with her immune system, with her ability to sleep through the night, um, with her mood, with her inflammation. So what I'm saying is that um, there's a lot of barriers that people have in just absorbing vitamin D in general. And so that's what people aren't looking at. They're looking at, oh yeah, well, the RDAs, that's going to be enough, really? So that's maybe if you're younger and you have no health problems at all and you have no genetic defects and you get regular sun, you know, and I mean, and you have low stress and you have no sugar in your diet. So try to find someone in that category, Steve. Yeah, that's a tough one. And by the way, to put things in perspective, you told me one day what, and I guess a lighter skinned person, how much vitamin D they get with a day in the sun. It sort of shocked me. Yeah, I did a whole video on the chart. Uh, I put a chart together on that. Um, it takes, and it, you'd be surprised how many um, hours you need in, of sunbathing to get your amount of vitamin D. It's so it's, Nowadays, people just don't have time to lay on the sun and uh, they have things to do. And so I'm going to be releasing a video on the importance of um, being outside for other reasons, too, um, just for health reasons, especially if you're a child. Um, Steve, do you, have you realized um, you ever drive down a neighborhood now and do you ever see any kids outside anymore? No, they're all pasty white down in the basement, getting sweaty and playing <laughs> video games. Just absolutely awful. So when you were a kid, Steve... Did you, were you outside a lot? Oh, listen, I had an opie upbringing and I'm telling you, we, we, I woke up in the morning, my duty was I had to make my bed and I would, would do that so quickly that I'd sleep on top of the cover so I could brush it off, smooth it. And I was out at 6 a.m. We ran around all day. We rode our bikes, um, you know, at, at lunch, one of the neighborhood 
uh, moms would fix us, you know, half a PB and J with the crust cut off. I know that's awful, but you know, we didn't consume much. And anyone that was overweight was an absolute anomaly. You, you just didn't right. see it. But the main thing, and of course, we're out in the sun all day and you quickly uh, get accustomed, you know, even with light skin, you get a nice coat of tan through the summer and uh, a very, very different world. And I know I would have succumbed to the video game world too if it had been, but they just didn't have it. So a deck of cards that you used to put on your tires to make a racket when you rode down the street, it was a great, great way to, to grow up. But those days are behind us, I think, around the world, even in developing countries. You know, everybody's got a smartphone. As long as you took the crust off that uh, your peanut butter and jelly sandwich, I think you probably were good. <laughs> it's just an absolute shot of carbohydrates. But again, we just ate so little that I think we got away with it. We were skinny and I don't recall feeling, uh, you know, too bad after pedaling all day long. Anyway, Dr. Berg, we got a lot of folks waiting. Uh, we're going to go to uh, uh, Kailash in a few moments, but let's get the next question out first. Then we'll go straight to him. And here it is. Okay, what determines the recovery of your sense of smell after an infection, like a viral infection? I've done several videos on this. I haven't shown you this one yet, but there's a very interesting, um, oh, without giving the answer, there's something that um, that happens that helps you recovery, cover after an uh, infection so you can then recover your smell. If Because a lot of people are getting viral infections, and... Um, and so then they lose their sense of smell, right? So there's something that helps you heal really fast. And if you don't have that something, you for six months, you could be suffering without the ability to smell, which can severely affect your ability to taste things. And I'm telling you, Steve, can you imagine, Steve, if you no longer had any sense of smell and you couldn't taste any food anymore? I know you like food, Steve, right? Love it. That's important to you. And if you get rid of that pleasure sensation of eating just think about how much weight you could lose but how much pleasure you wouldn't have because now you can't even enjoy the, the food that you eat well, absolutely and food is a great joy and doesn't have to be your enemy if you look at it practically and i'm a, a diehard intermittent faster so i really look forward to that three hour period that i get to eat and I'm not bothered by it, and rather than just thinking, oh, gosh, another swing through Krispy Kreme is a miserable way to live. But it can be a great joy, too, if you eat healthily. Uh, and Dr. Berg, you sure taught a lot of us to do that. I tell you, what, why don't we go to our friend from Connecticut, uh, Kailash. And Kailash, you're on with Dr. Berg. Go ahead. Sure. Thank you, Steve. Hey, Dr. Berg. Thank you. I appreciate you and your team for this opportunity. How are you? Great. Thanks. Yeah, so my question straight away, obviously I am a long-term follower for over four years, and as you were telling, I am a daily, I take K2 and, and D3 combination for continuously for three years. Yeah, I can't tell how many benefits it has given me. But now my question is, Dr. Berg, I started keto three times. First, I stopped after a week because of upset stomach, I mean, the constipation and bad, bad breath. Same problem second time when I tried it after six or seven months. I was most successful in my recent attempts, which was three months ago. When I did it for three weeks, I reduced my 10 pounds weight and I saw the result. But one day I started feeling vertigo, as you call it, and uh, also vomiting, which lasted for two days. Then I stopped that and I think I was doing something wrong. So could you please advise what, I should do differently next time so that I don't get into this problem. Thank you. Right. It's a difficult question because uh, to evaluate that, I have to like look at all the data, what you've been eating. I, I will say this, though. Um, it sounds to me, especially if you had vertigo <laughs> um, or if you're vomiting, that there was some nutritional deficiency that you had, when you, especially if you're doing a combination of you know, intermittent fasting as well as keto. Um, I think you, you need to make sure you're taking all the basics. That would be trace minerals, minerals, the vitamins, the fat soluble and the water soluble um, vitamin C as well. And uh, make sure make sure they're in natural sources. Um, and then you look at the quality of food too. Sometimes people, like I'll give you an example. In, when I was in practice, I had this one lady, she put her on the ketogenic diet and she broke out in a serious rash of hives and i'm like where where's this coming from i'm mean, she's eating, eating she was eating healthy we find out she was highly allergic to 
most of the vegetables that she was eating, which was a shocker because normally you wouldn't be allergic to vegetables. Well, she had a sensitivity to them and she cut them out. But then getting more data, she had a problem with her gut. And so she couldn't couldn't deal with a lot of these vegetables. So that's another factor. Like you may have some malabsorption issue that prevents you from digesting some of these vegetables, which then could create different effects, side effects. So you may want to try less and maybe some cooked vegetables or more fermented, which can help you but with your gut. But if you have this uh, bad breath situation, uh, one solution would be um, a good probiotic. And I'm not biased of my own that I have, the liquid, but I will say that um, you could take that liquid probiotic and you could pour a little capful in your sump pump downstairs, and within a day, notice all the smell is gone. So it definitely purifies the body, and it helps you, it helps deodorize the body. Um, so it's not just necessarily about consuming things like chlorophyll. It's about getting your microbiome correct because they're the best decomposers. They're the they um they will turn food into um, smaller particles, they help break things down, they help get rid of waste. And I think that's probably an important thing that you need is a more, a, a good probiotic that can help deal with that more than I think about it. You're welcome. Thanks for coming on. Well, that's great. Well, listen, thanks so much, Dr. Berg. And by the way, Dr. Berg, I know you've long wondered how I could possibly not only be so handsome, but uh, so focused. Well, I'll tell you how. It's new Dr. Berg's nutritional yeast. I gulp the stuff. I just got to put a plug in it. I just had a handful before the show started, and I crunch on them in between. And the other remedy that it solves is when I, I'm, a, as I told you, intermittent fasting. And whenever I feel like being naughty, Dr. Berg, why I just crunch a few of these, and it kind of sates me and carries me through to the next meal. So that's my great success story with your supplement. So I am biased, obviously. And let's hey, see. Just out of curiosity, Steve, but what what um, what is your your biggest weakness as far as food? What what do you like? If you could, you know, give in to some unhealthy food, what what would that be? Is your is your top thing that you? It's not keto friendly, but you like it. Well, I well yeah, it's definitely desserts. I can, and I'm embarrassed to admit this. I can wolf down six glazed donuts in under five minutes. I mean, I just when in, when my poor kids were young, I'd cook a tray of brownies, and they were lucky if they got that little lousy crust that was left around the edge of the tray. So they would race to get their brownie before Dad ate fourteen. And I'm and I know it sounds I'm not being comedic. I could really do that. Not in five minutes, but before midnight showed up, all those brownies were gone. So I have a terrible addiction to that kind of food. So I cut it all out. I cannot have a dessert, you know, with a meal at some point without then later ending up at Dunkin' Donuts. So I don't do it all. I'm, I'm helpless. Other foods, you know, I mean, bread, I'll have it sometimes a little bit. Um, and that's so it's not the keto. It's the donuts and the cake and the hot fudge sundaes and all that. I'm absolutely helpless. How, how many? Well, how many donuts? What was the your? What was your top amount of donuts that you consumed in one sitting? Well, you know, like at an office, you know, they somebody brings in the pink box, and I looked in sort of admiration to people who would come by and put one on their plate, eat half of it, and they go about their business. And if no one's looking, I'd fire them all down. I, mean, I could have twelve donuts in a morning, no question. So. Um, uh, That's I amazing. Just, I, I, I one time I actually did have twelve donuts myself too, a dozen, and uh, boy, talk about a, um, a a sugar rush on steroids! Wow, incredible. Oh yeah, and then you pay the price. You feel like oh, I won't say it. You feel bad. Terrible. Yeah, you know, just terrible. absolutely. And then the depression comes in. So now, whenever I see it, I say, uh, Steve, you want to pick up a box of misery? And you know, how about a side order of regret? And then I say, okay, I, I get it. I'm not going to do it. Let me go have some of, uh, as I mentioned, a few of these guys, and wait till my delicious meal during my intermittent fasting. And life is much better doing that. Well, listen, we've got some answers here for yeah. our latest uh, quiz question, and it asks, what determines recovery of your sense of smell after an infection? And our audience uh, say uh, zinc, 15 percent. Uh, others say vitamin A and 5% say vitamin C. How smart is our audience on this one? This is an interesting, it's a new study that was put out. This is actually fascinating because 
they found that the more insulin resistance you have, and I've hit this topic a thousand times, if you have more insulin resistance, which means that you don't absorb insulin that well, you're going to have a serious time recovering. Why? Because in the brain, um, the part of your brain that has the most receptors for insulin is the olfactory region. That's the part where you're actually, you sense the smell is located. And it has massive amounts of receptors for insulin because it, the smell and the taste is related to food and metabolism. And so uh, they found that if you damage those, uh, those receptors, that insulin comes in to help you repair it. But if you have insulin resistance, which the majority of the population has, then it's not going to heal that well. Now, they've done um, some interesting studies using an intranasal insulin spray. It goes right into the sinuses, right up into your brain. And they saw remarkable uh, results within immediately with the sense of smell. And so that's apparently a therapy that people are using. But why not just fix insulin resistance, right? Um, so in the video that I'm going to put out this next week, um, I, I explain how to do that. And most people that are watching already know that. Uh, but there's some additional things that you can learn from. But um, yeah, it's that insulin resistance. If you don't have insulin resistance, you'll recover your sense of smell really fast. If you do, it's going to take a lot longer. It could take six months or longer. So that's great data. Yeah, yikes. Okay, I tell you what, we're going to go to Anya in a country you love very much, Italy. But first, let's uh, knock out the next question. Go ahead, Dr. Berg. All right, which vitamin is best to raise your HDL, high-density lipoproteins, the so-called good cholesterol? Okay, what vitamin is best to do that? Okay, stand by, Dr. Berg. We're going to bring her in in just a second here. Lost her shot for just a minute. Hang on. Anya, we'll be right with you. And we should have that little jingle playing while we're having some dead air there, but it won't be long. Okay, and here she is. Anya on with Dr. Berg. Go ahead, Anya. Hello, Dr. Berg. It's great to meet you in person. Thank you. Um, your amazing inspiration online to all of us. Really amazing. I've had an ill daughter, and you've really helped me with lots of lots of things. So thank you. Um, okay, so I'm over 50. I'm not going to say how old. And um, I have a pregnant stomach, and I'm not pregnant. Mm -hmm. And I eat keto. I live in Umbria, uh, between Florence and Rome, and I live all on organic food. I love that way of life, and I've, really, I, I've aced all the way of life. But my body, though in great condition, have massive of energy and feel amazing, has this pregnant stomach all the time. Uh, no, really, any, not particularly anywhere else. And uh, have one serious issue, which is if I eat any sugar at all, wine, anything that has sugar in it, I remain awake all night. Literally, it's like having cocaine. You just sort of awake, wide awake all night. So I don't know if that's related to the stomach, but I am desperate to get rid of my stomach because mm. it's just a much that I don't need in my life. You know, I, I feel for you, especially if you're in Italy, which is probably a wonderful place to um, live. Um, uh, unfortunately, the food is so tempting, I, I could imagine that might be tough. But here's a question. Um, is your stomach, the shape of your stomach, is it is it um, on the higher part or is it on the lower part of your stomach as far as sagging? Like, is it is it like a bloated stomach or is it just like a superficial fat? Describe it to me a little bit more. Oops, I think we okay, lost. Okay, oh, so go. it looks like somebody's inside there and stretched it out around my belly button area. It's like there's a ball inside my stomach permanently. Whatever I eat, if it's if it's not great, if it's got sugar in it, then it gets bigger. But every time I eat, it gets bigger, and then it just goes back to the ball. The ball never goes away, even if I'm like living on soup and salad and literally keeping it as light as possible. I have reduced my... Um, I've done more fasting recently, so I've stopped eating in the evenings. I st stop at six o'clock. That's really helped me in terms of sleeping and just feeling better. So your fasting is great, but it's not getting rid of the stomach. And I, my okay. husband says to me, you know, you don't really eat that much. 
How can yeah. you have this permanent ball in your stomach? Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's fat. I don't think. I don't think it's fat. I, I think there's uh, there's either something going on in the intestines, or um, there's some type of swelling or inflammation going on in the gut. Um, so, if you when you uh, fast, can you go to a point um, like? Let me ask you this uh, a little differently. Do you get hungry and then you eat, or do you ever eat when you're not even hungry? Because it's time to eat. I'm not sure she heard well, that. Well, I try not to eat at all until I'm hungry. But if I wait too long, then I over, I, over, I overeat. So okay. I try to wait till I'm hungry. But that's not very good because if I do that, then I can overeat. So I, I try to just eat regular. I'm trying to make this structure of eating at 11 a.m. and then just two meals a day. It's quite hard, actually. It's hard work. But yeah. I, I, that's what I'm aiming to do because I think that's better for me. So I, I think uh, I think one thing that's going to help you more than anything is to take um, a liquid probiotic right before bed. And um, <clears throat> I think there's some type of um, imbalance in your microorganisms in your gut, which because <clears throat> it, the sugar gets fermented, there's certain types of imbalances. There's like could be a a yeast overgrowth, for example, that just lives on sugar. And as soon as you feed it sugar, wow, just flares up and it's just going to uh, cause uh, all a chain reaction that's going to keep you wired at night, uh, especially. And so I think that's the biggest clue. So there's an imbalance with um, your microbiome. And I, I think there could be either too much um, yeast or, or maybe a certain bacteria. Uh, I think what you need to do is to really kind of focus in on this um, this gut flora. Um, I think um, that's one thing. And then the other thing is you may want to try different versions of the ketogenic diet um, that have completely, like switch up your vegetables, for example. Um, have more vegetables, have less. Uh, have cooked vegetables, have fermented, and just see what your body is re uh, responding to and primarily to feed the microbes that you need in there to, to prevent this effect that you're getting. Um, the fact that um, if you don't eat, you kind of, you like you need to eat or you might feel dizzy and things like that, that tells me that there's definitely, um, we need to get you into a state where you're fat adapted. And that does take, could take three months um, of consistent working to go longer and longer. Ideally for you, one meal a day is going to be okay. the goal that I would go after. And then even if you had to add some MCT oil and go through a little a few days of adaptation, that fasting is going to probably be the best thing to resolve this stomach uh, because from several uh, ways. For, number one, just for divert, it'll you'll make more, you'll actually create more survival for your microbes by fasting than if you were to feed them. They just, uh, the good ones just do better. And um, there's something in the back of my head that also says that you want to check for something called SIBO. Um, you should look up the videos on that and see if that could be another thing that you can do. I've done it. I don't okay. have SIBO. Okay, good. I, I've done SIBO tests. Okay. Um, those are some That's things. That's fantastic. I'm... Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Excellent. Sure. That's terrific. Well, thank you so much, uh, Anya. And anybody that lives in Italy has uh, got a real challenge because, boy, is that great food. And I know they got healthy food, but that's not what I order when I go there. Anyway, Dr. Berg, let's answer the uh, question, <laughs> which vitamin is the best? Well, she's, she's laughing. She knows the challenge. Uh, which vitamin is best to raise your HDL? And 55% say vitamin E, 20% say omega-3s, 15% say vitamin K, and 10% say niacin. Any smarty pants out there, Dr. Berg? Well, this is a, I think this is good that I'm bringing this up because um, it's actually niacin. It's B3. And it's the one that creates the flush. If you take the one that's non-flush, it won't work for your increasing your HDL. Uh, but vitamin D3 is a potent um, agent to increase your HDL. Um, they have not found any drug that will increase your HDL that results in better health or uh, less side effects. So it's really that that vitamin B3 is um, is the key for HDL. 
I will release the video. Um, but I have a textbook on vitamin D3. It's fascinating. I, I can't stop reading it. And it's just the, the benefit, the benefits of vitamin B3 are just amazing for the body and um, of what that does and the mechanism of how it works. So stay tuned for more videos on B3. It's a fascinating vitamin. All right. Well, that's terrific. And Dr. Burgoy says, we never leave anybody hanging, even though we're short on time, we are going to get to everybody. So we're going to go to Anna, who is in Oregon and finding a little leaf from all the heat that's been going up there. Anna, you're on with Dr. Berg. Hello, Dr. Berg. Thanks so much for taking my video. Hello. My question is um, for my husband, because I do keto, but he has been labeled type one and a half by his doctor. Um, he was originally type two, and then they put him on insulin a few years later. He takes uh, long acting insulin once a day. He, he's been taking uh, 15 units. He does low carb with me, um, but the question is, what's the best way to manage his blood sugars and stay in ketosis? Because sometimes he does have those low blood sugar moments, so we need to know how he can stay in the ketosis but still not die of low blood sugar. Right. <clears throat> so type 1 and a half is the situation where you're type 2, but then you have to take insulin which means that he's running out of insulin or he has, uh, it also means that he has severe insulin resistance. So we have a combination of insulin resistance, which actually shows up as an insulin deficiency because insulin doesn't work anymore. And so now he has to take more insulin to help uh, keep his blood sugars from going too high. Now the question is how do we regulate this? Well, just realize that the side effects from that additional insulin is, is just as bad as having high sugar. And what insulin is doing, it's taking the sugar out of the blood and putting it somewhere else. It's not making it evaporate. So it's hiding it as fat on his liver and his organs. So really, the, his goal should be uh, to decrease um, the need for insulin as much as possible. Um, how do you do that? lower the carb, do intermittent fasting as much as possible. So then the need for insulin goes down. Now what's going to happen is blood sugars are going to come down. Well, great. That's what we want. But the problem is the doctor is going to say, well, we don't want it too low. Well, great. Then let's, uh, let's take less medication so we don't push it down even more. So it's really in a, it's a, a judgment of um, taking less medication and being able to control that um, because he probably needs medication now or else his blood sugars would be too high. Well, just take less and less and less to the point where you can have normal blood sugars. And so I think over time, if he were to go on a true healthy keto version diet uh, with intermittent fasting, the need for that insulin would go way, way, way down. So then then his blood sugar, he, he won't need to take the, as much medication. His blood sugars would do better. And... Um, it's kind of a, a, a juggle um, to the point where, you know, the side effects are less. The other thing I would highly recommend are the nutrients um, like benfotamine, um, alpha lipoic acid, and there's others as well that will at least decrease the side effects from this condition, at least minimize the complications of diabetes. So even though he has diabetes, um, he has less side effects. So that would be an important thing, too, to increase his, his life. Um, so I, that was kind of a long, long answer, but that's what I would recommend. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Hey, listen, thanks so much, uh, Anna, for coming in. I'm glad that Oregon is cooling down a little bit. And again, we're not going to leave anybody hanging. So let's see if we can. You're very popular in India. And I'm going to butcher his name, I think. But Varanjit from India, I believe, is on with us. Can you hear us, Varanjit? Uh, yes. Uh, good morning, uh, Dr. Bob. Good morning. And can, can you hear me? Hear me? Yes. Uh, hi. So, uh, th firstly, thank you for you know all the videos and the knowledge that you've been sharing with us. And I'm I'm a really big fan of yours. So my question is, uh, I uh, started keto and intermittent fasting in Feb this year, so it's been around six months. 
and uh, uh, i've been doing high intensity uh, interval workouts uh, five days a week and the other day i'm uh, you know i'm i'm really active like i'm walking uh, so uh, I I I noticed I noticed recently for the last couple of months I've been uh, getting some uh, symptoms that are similar to ad- adrenal fatigue, and uh, uh, so I'm I'm uh, I'm wondering uh, you know I I tried uh, though my vitamin D levels are sufficient whenever I take vitamin D like I take twenty thousand I use a vitamin D I feel more energetic. So I uh, should I continue with, with uh, vitamin D or yes, um, because that's a really key factor, especially when we're on keto. But th- when you're on keto and doing intermittent fasting, the need for B vitamins go up. So I think you'll benefit uh, from vitamin B1 and some of the other B vitamins. So if you were to add, get some nutritional yeast, add that to your diet, I think your energy will go up, your adrenals will be happier. But I think. What you're missing is the B vitamins. Take more of those, especially if they're related to adrenal fatigue. And because um, that's what happens if you don't have more Bs when you're on keto, uh, you might get tired. It's called keto fatigue. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thank and then, thanks. Steve, let's go to who should we go to? Helena? Well, let's see. No, actually, uh, let's see if we can hear. Helena, can you hear us? Yes. Oh, great. Why don't you ask your question of Dr. Berg real quickly? Okay. First off is uh, Dr. Berg did not mention about grapeseed oil. So that's one question. And uh, secondly is uh, I just started keto and uh, I kind of uh, have a habit of eating one orange a day. And that's hard for me to, um, to give up. And I want to find out uh, what happens uh, if I still continue to do that. And the third is how do I know that um, if I'm not 100% keto, so, so then when I eat the fat, am I storing the fat and it, it doesn't get burned um, as energy? So that's my question. It all depends on your metabolism. If you're how many carbs you're having, um, and if you, your your activity as well, um, as far as how many, how much if you're going to burn or store, um, you'd have to look at how many carbs you're consuming from that orange, and uh, it, and is it within 50 grams? And then that means the rest of your foods. What what does that add up to? Like you want to calculate the amount of um, carbs in your whole day to ideally to be in keto. Or else you're just going to not get the benefit of keto with that orange, unfortunately. Now you have grapefruit seed extract and you have grape seed extract. Grape seed extract is a very powerful antioxidant, anti-inflammatory. It has anti-cancer properties and it's a really good thing for many different conditions. I think I've done a video on it. But the grapefruit seed extract is good for fungus and um, microbes that are pathogenic in the body. And you can use it topically or, or in your body. So, uh, and, and I have a video on that as well. Sorry to cut you off, but I hope that answered the question because we want to also uh, address everyone else's question in the next minute or so. Uh, who do we have next, Steve? Well, actually, I think what we, the only thing we have time for now is for you to talk about our upcoming videos. Let me put them up. All right. So the top remedies for a UTI uh, we're going to talk about vitamin B5, your adrenals, um, <clears throat> which for some people, it helps them sleep. For other people, it can keep them up. So it's kind of a 50-50 situation for, for vitamin B5 when you're sleeping. Vertigo, we've already given the, let the cat out of the bag with that one, but there's more to that. Um, also, restoring your sense of smell, that's going to be a good one. Key foods for Parkinson's. I have three more videos that are, I think, very interesting for children, raising children, what they should be eating. Um, and uh, to maximize their IQ and brain development and cognitive and mood. Um, I'm really interested in that topic because if you have kids, there's so many things you can do to, to get them so healthy that they can avoid a lot of issues down the road like we're going through, right? We want to 
learn from other mistakes. But the problem is kids don't have have the experience yet. So if you wait till they're teenagers, it's too late. They might be already set in their ways. Right, Steve? You're absolutely right. And by the way, you saw everybody in the green room, but we got to everybody this week. Uh, for those in the audience, you can't see it, but we have all our uh, guest appearances in this big sort of hodgepodge of videos and they can see each other. And so Dr. Berg always is adamant to make sure that we get uh, a voice from everyone that dials in from around the world. And we accomplished that week. And Doc, with that, why don't you take us out? Hey, have a great weekend. We will see you next week and stay tuned for some uh, real interesting videos coming up this, this next week.